First Chronicles chapter 11, verse 16, verse 19. And David was then in the hold. And the Philistines garrison was then at Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. And the three break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. But David would not drink it, drink of it, but poured it out to the Lord. And said, my God forbid it. That is, I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men? That have put their lives in jeopardy. For with the jeopardy of, the, of their lives. They brought it. That they brought this water. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did. These three mightiest. The Lord bless his word in Jesus name. I'm speaking on the subject brutal dedication. Brutal dedication. And our objective is to understand the principle and power of brutal or extreme dedication. Let me start by defining or clarifying what dedication to God means. When you say dedication, at least five things come to mind. Number one, affection for God. Somebody who is dedicated to God is somebody who has affection for God. He loves God. First Kings chapter 3 verse 3, the Bible said, And Solomon loved the Lord. First Chronicles chapter 29 verse 3, David said, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. So dedication means affection for God. Secondly, it means devotion to God. Where a person is devoted to God. Certain things he does out of his dedication involves his devotion. For example, Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, Daniel opened his windows three times a day and prayed as at other times. That was his devotion to God as a result of his dedication. Genesis chapter 19 verse 27, Abraham stood up in the place, got up early in the morning into the place where he stood before the Lord. He was devoted to God because of his dedication to God. So, the, 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 the dedication means affection for God, devotion to God. Number three, it means submission to God. Submission. My life is not mine. I, like Paul the Apostle will say in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But the life I now live in the flesh does not even belong to me. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it means submission to God. God is my owner. God is the one in charge of my life. Number four, it means addiction to God. Dedication to God means addiction to God. That is, you are literally living on God. You are literally, you, you run on God like cars run on fuel. You run on God like a cocaine addict cannot survive without cocaine. You cannot survive without, without God. Like it says in Philippians chapter 1 verse 25, Paul the apostle speaking said, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Life for me means Christ. Without Christ I can't survive. I am addicted to him. Addicted to him. 
Finally, number five, dedication to God means donation to God. Donate. I dash myself to God. Always my life again and again on you. On you. Donated to God. God owns me. I dash myself to God. That is what dedication to God referred to. Now, in the journey, so it's affection for God, devotion to God, submission to God, addiction to God, donation to God. In the journey of dedication, there are four categories of people in church. Number one, they generally undedicated. I wanted to say they notoriously undedicated. But let me temper it down by saying they generally undedicated. Those are the people you don't expect anything much from. People that don't pay any special attention to kingdom matters. They come to church when they feel like coming. If they wake up on Sunday morning and they don't feel good, no need to go to church. If, they, if there is a football game or something they want to watch on Sunday morning or midweek service, church doesn't mean anything. That's generally undedicated. Both God and man don't expect anything from them much as far as their relationships with God are concerned. Generally undedicated. God can rely on them for nothing. Church can rely on them for nothing. You remember when Jesus was going, to, all right, I'll come to that. Number two is what I call the nominally dedicated, nominally, nominally dedicated. These are those that are religiously dedicated. It's a nominal Christian, nominally dedicated. They may not miss church. They may not miss any activity of church. But lifestyle is completely untouched. Lifestyle is completely unchanged. Church attendance does not change their lifestyle. Church attendance does not change their cycle of friends. Church attendance does not change anything. I mean, it doesn't matter what you preach. They will come to church. But as for alcohol, they can, they rather die than stop drinking. They rather die than stop smoking. They rather die than stop womanizing or whatever it is. They're nominally dedicated. Everybody confirms that they come to church. But that is where it stops. Outside the church, nothing. Number three, you have the averagely dedicated. Averagely. These people try their best to be upright. They try their best to be spiritual. But they are not willing to go all the way with Jesus. No, they are not willing. They won't risk anything for God. No, they can't risk anything for God. Like we sing the old song. All the way to Calvary, he went for me. He went for me. He went for me. All the way to Calvary, he went for me. He died to set me free. And I will never, never stop my journey halfway. Halfway until I reach my own. No, these ones are just averagely. It's okay, he's trying his prayer life, he's trying, but not all the way, you know. There are some things that are too, too far, too fanatical. And then, of course, they won't no risk for God. And then, finally, we have what I call the extremely dedicated, which is the brutally dedicated, which is what we are dealing with tonight. That is, all the way with God, they will go. All the way with God. They are ready to go all the way with God. These are the people that see the best of God. If there are 12 of our pastors here, I would like you to just come from, from here. As many of you are here. And then, all right, yes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All right. 
can all right it's okay let me now jesus had 12 disciples and there were multitudes at the foot of the mountain all of you come up here and he came up here follow me one two three follow me just it's okay the rest can remain <laughs> come and they went a bit and himself said, let me just go further. So you have the crowd down there. Now, all of us here are brutally committed. This is just illustration. You have the crowd down there. That is the notoriously undedicated. Not you. Talking of that. And then you have the next level, the nominally dedicated. Then you have another level, the averagely dedicated, and then himself went further in brutal dedication. Don't forget for as long as we live, these four levels exist. But the people who see the most out of life and out of God are those who come here. Am I communicating? All right, still come forward. All of you now come forward. And stand here. Stand like this. Yes, stand right. And the men of David, I'll now choose th three other people now. One, two, three, come. David was in a hole. And then, that is a passage we read. He wasn't talking to anybody. He was whispering to himself. Oh, I wish I can drink, get a cup of water from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. And these three guys heard that their master was looking for water from a particular well. But that well, before you reach it, you have to fight off the Philistines. The garrison of the Philistines was in between David and the well. And these people carried the cup in their hands. Master, you want to drink it? You have it. And there they took their sword. And then fought their way through. And went all the way there. Got the water. And they were still coming to meet enemies waiting for them. And fought their way again through. Say, Master, here is the cup of water. David looked at it and said, no. This is too much. If I drink this water now, it's your blood I'm drinking. It's your blood now. You took your lives in your hand just to make me drink water. You fought your way. You almost got killed. Me, myself, I surrender this water to God. I he poured it out as a, as a drink offering. Let heaven receive it. Let this sacrifice be a sacrifice from you to him. Let him bless you for fighting this kind of fight. Everything we read in the Old Testament is the shadow of the new. God is looking for this kind of people to dare the enemy and quench his thirst. Go back to your seat. What are the, what, when we say somebody is brutally dedicated to God, what does it entail? Five things out of many. Number one, hearing the longings of the master. When you hear the longings of your master, being in touch with the heartbeat of your master, being in touch with the heartbeat 
the yearnings, the longings of the master. Feeling what he feels. Perceiving and sensing his desire. You are not just in church. You are not just a worker. You hear what the master longs for. Because I believe that it is not possible for a person to effectively serve a master whose needs he doesn't know. You, you can't serve a master effectively, successfully until you understand his passion, until you understand his needs. How can you bring pleasure to someone whose passion you don't know? Hearing the yearnings, the longings, hearing the longings of the master is the number one component. As a child of God, as a Christian, as a church worker, as a pastor, when last did you feel something that was a concern to God? When last did you feel a burden that you can call this is a burden from God? God is bothered about this. And he's looking for who would do something about it. Like the bloodshed and wastage that is going on in our country. Feeling, hearing the yearnings, the longings of the master. Number two, moving at the speed of the master's thought. Moving at the speed of the master's thought and longing. A situation where his wish is your immediate command. His wish is your command. It is not the situation where you are waiting to be begged to do something. You are not waiting to be coerced to work for God. You are not waiting to be cajoled to work for God. You are not waiting for unnecessary and extra explanation. To do things for God. And I want you to notice that he wasn't talking to anybody in particular. I wish I can get water from the well of Bethlehem. And somebody picked it up. And didn't wait to ask how, when, where. He ran, they ran, they ran. Talking about you cannot, you cannot watch the master in need and not act urgently. Moving at the speed of the master's thought. When we talk about brutal or extremely dedicated people, you are not a kingdom time waster. You are not a time waster at all. And I want you to understand tonight, beloved, it is not enough to do the master's will. It is important to do it speedily. It's not what you do for God that is even most important. It's how fast did you do it? Were you ready to do it? How eager? How, how was the level of your eagerness to do it? There are those who do good things very sluggishly. They do what they are expected to do very, very sluggishly. Almost waiting until they are begged. They do kingdom assignment very sloppishly. Lackadaisically. They did the will of God but did it too late. It's moving. At the speed. Of the master's thought. Brutal. Number three. It is breaking barriers. And surmounting obstacles. To do the master's will. That is brutal dedication. Breaking barriers. And surmounting obstacles. To do the master's will. To meet the master's need. Breaking barriers. Surmounting obstacles. The Bible said they broke through. They broke through. There was something they broke. They broke through. That is. No reason is reasonable enough to stop you from doing what you know God wants you to do with your life. 
or you know God wants you to do in his house. No reason is reasonable enough. No excuse is tenable. No excuse is tenable. You are ready to, to break down any barrier, dismantle any obstacle to give the master pleasure. If a, if, a, if a man comes in between you and what God wants you to do, be on your way. If a relationship comes between you and the will of God, or you are on your own. If a, a particular kind of job comes between you and what you know God wants you to do with your life, you are on your own, you job. You break the barriers, you surmount the obstacles. Number four, are you ready for this? It is taking risks and confronting hazards and dangers to do the will of the master. That is brutal dedication. Taking risks and confronting hazards and dangers to do the will of the master. You may not hear this kind of message <laughs> regularly, but this is reality. Confronting risks like, like, like David, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of my creator. Like Elijah, before God whom I stand, there shall be no rain nor dew in this land, you wicked king, except by my word. Taking risks, confronting hazards, dangers, to do the will of the master. The God whom I serve is able to deliver me and he will. But even if not, Nebuchadnezzar, let it be known to you, we shall not bow for your God. And when Daniel saw that the decree was sealed, he went and opened his windows and prayed as at other times so that I can dare any devil that can come and touch me. Taking risks, confronting hazards to do the will of the master. It is jeopardizing life itself and every other thing else to do the master's will. Like Esther, if I perish, I perish. And she never could perish. Because those who say that never perish. Mary jeopardized her marital destiny when the angel said she was going to be pregnant without a man. That is wedding plans cancelled. That is everything cancelled. That is move about and let people ridicule you as that girl who is pregnant and claim that uh, spirit pregnanted her. She jeopardized everything. But if God wants me to be pregnant and he wants to cancel my plan to wed and he wants me to go about with this kind of reproach, I am ready. Taking risks. Confronting hazards. Confronting dangers. Those who are too careful never go far with God. Those who are comfort minded never go far with God. Those who are convenient, convenience minded never go far with God. It is casting aside the idea of comfort. The idea of convenience. And in this case of this story, the idea of safety to do the will and pleasure of the master. Listen. We live in a pleasure-driven world today. There are ma many people who can do anything for God provided it costs them nothing. Oh, there are many people who can do anything for God, provided it doesn't inconvenience them. There are many people who can do anything for God, provided it doesn't temper with their comfort. Oh yes, God, whatever you want, I will do. Please don't touch anything that, is, that, that destabilizes my comfort. But brutal, extreme dedication. Where oh, yeah, you send me, I will go in the army. Where oh, yeah, you send me, I will go in the army. 
where you send me I'll go in the army I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord and my God knows the way through the wilderness all I need to do is to follow my God knows the way through the wilderness all I have to do is to follow there are people their wardrobe cannot even change <laughs> they are serving God nothing changed Oh no, I can't, can't touch the way I, I like to look. Taking risks, confronting hazards and dangers. Number five, it is meeting the hunger and thirst of the master at any cost. Brutal dedication. Extreme dedication. Meeting the hunger and the thirst of the master at any cost ensuring that the master is not in need where you are ensuring the master is not in need where you are able to do something and you did nothing Meeting the hunger. You see, the reason why the fig tree attracted the curse was because the master was hungry and the fig tree was not equal to the task. He was coming, the Bible says he was hungry and he wanted to look for something to eat on the fig tree and the fig tree had leaves. But it was in the time of figs and I read the history of figs. That was Mark chapter 11. That the figs, when they don't have fruit, they don't have leaves. So every time you see leaves on the fig, there is meant to be fruit. So Jesus saw leaves and was coming to get fruit, thinking that he was going to get fruit, not knowing that it was a hypocrite fig tree. Having a form of godliness but denying the power. Not knowing it was a deceptive fig tree. Having uh, a semblance of a life that was not there. The Bible said, and Jesus answered it. <laughs> and, and Jesus answered and said, and I was saying, why will Jesus answer? It means the fig tree said something. You only answer when somebody talks. I know, I mean, it looks like in the realm of the spirit, the fig tree mocked him. I thought you asked Jesus, and you have gift of revelation. Why didn't you know that I don't have fruit? You are coming to take fruit. He replied, no man eats fruit from you forever. For being a hypocrite and for trying to mock me. Am I communicating? Brutal, dedicated service. That is the service of Paul. That was the service of Paul the Apostle. That was the service of Mary. That was the service of Abraham where he gave his only son Isaac. That is the kind of service of those who go far with God. I'd like you to take note of this. The master was not just asking for water. If you say, I want to drink water, they can go to the room and fetch water or look for water anywhere. But he was asking for water from a particular place. And he didn't even say it out. I mean, he didn't even send anybody for it. It was just speaking loud his mind. Not to anybody. Take note of the following as a roundoff. 
Number one, it is not enough to do something for God. It is important to do what God wants. Oh, I'm doing, I'm working for God. I am doing things for God. It's like he went to River Jordan to fetch water when he's asking for water from the well of Bethlehem. It's like he went to the pool of Gennesaret. There are many people who are doing one thing or the other for God except the particular things God wants them to do or the sacrifice involved in what they should do for God. Yes, general things we can do. But is there something more you want me to do for you? It's not just, it's not just water. It is water from the well of Bethlehem. It is not just important to do something for God. It's important to do what God values. There was water everywhere, but the one he valued was that water from the well of Bethlehem. He values this, the winning of souls. He has value for, for, for the destinies of people. He has value for caring for the poor. Secondly, note. What he asked them to do was not convenient at all. It, was, it involved sacrifice. Second, what is commanded is superior to what is convenient. It is not enough to do what is convenient for God. It is important to do what is commanded by God. What is com commanded is superior to what is convenient. Thirdly, it is important to do what you know God loves without asking to be told to do it. It is important to, to do to, it is important to do what you know God loves. Without waiting to be specifically asked to do it. Those people who went to fetch the water, he didn't send them to do it. They only knew that this, he wanted that done. Go and preach to souls. I am not led. <laughs> Go and do this for God. I have no leading. It is, it is important to do what you know God loves without waiting to be asked to do it. It is as if my wife is waiting to ask me for what I know she knows I, I, I'm in need of. I just returned back from work. Don't ask me, do you want to eat? Or can you drink water or something? Just go ahead. And listen. Listen. I believe that many people were there when David spoke his mind, but only three responded. That's how it is in church. Many times we wait for each other to do something first. But this is the point. Do what you know is necessary. Always do what is, you know is necessary to do for God without waiting for who will do it first. You don't have to wait for who will do it first. If you know this is necessary to do for God, you don't, don't wait. You see, if you wait for people to, to, to facilitate your commitment, you will die uncommitted. Always do what you know is necessary to do for God without waiting for who will do it first or for who else is doing the same thing or for who else is doing it. Beloved, that 
this word has kept many of us where we are. Your friend may not run as, as fast as you want to run. And you, you can't let your friend hold you back. That is why it's even important to marry the right wife and husband. Because there are people in your life who may not do, who may not be as aggressive and as fervent as you want to be with God. So you don't wait. So that you don't waste. Finally, brutal dedication is the way of drastic manifestation with God. Is the way of drastic manifestations. Is the way of drastic distinction. Is the way of drastic elevation. If we don't do the same things with God, we can't see the same results from God. It's the way of drastic manifestation. The way of drastic elevation. The way of drastic distinction. Those three men, they were classified the three mighty men of David. There were 30 men that David had that were, I mean, Men that could stand in the midst of snow and fight with lions on bare hands. But these three men excelled out of the 30. Say David had three mighty men, but there were three men that were on top of the 30. Abishai, Asahel, three of them. Very brutal men. And eternal archives cannot forget their name. And as David poured their sacrifice before God, it is like, oh God, take them further. Take them higher. You never go down in life if you, determine, if you are determined to go far with God. Say that again. You can never go down in life if you are determined to go far with God. You can never go down in life if you are determined to go far with God. You can never go down in life. The only place you are permitted to go is up. Up and up. As we round off on this in the month of dedication, even though we have the nation's worship on Friday, I welcome you. Don't just be that Christian that is notoriously undedicated. Even unbelievers know that that one just goes to church. Or nominally dedicated. You come to church, but that's all. You are there every service, every midweek, but that's all. Nothing changed. Alcohol, booze is still on. The wrong friends are still on. All manner of gambling is still on. And don't be that person that is just average. Average is not good enough. Just go, go extreme. And it takes the extra to see the extraordinary. I welcome you to this season brutal commitment. Pick this message, listen to it, give it to your friends, and move to the next level. Stand up on your feet, lift your hands, and let's appreciate God.